Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Today. Foundations of Business Continuity. My name is Holly and I'm part of the professional development team here at IIRSM. Our speaker today is Carla Garn, Senior Manager within the Risk Advisory and Analytics team at Barnet Waddingham. Before I hand over to Carla, there are just a couple of things to run through first. So to begin with, you'll be on mute for the duration of the webinar. But if you have any questions, feel free to ask these using the chat function on the bottom right hand corner and we will address these at the end. And secondly, the webinar is being recorded and a copy of the recording will be placed on the IIRSM YouTube channel after the event. Okay, that's enough from me. Carla, over to you. Thanks, Holly. Um, so as Holly has said, I'm Carla Garn. I am the Senior Manager of Risk and Advisory and Analytics at Barnett Waddingham. I have uh, been a Risk and Business Continuity Manager for many years now, operating in this role internationally. Um, from a business continuity perspective, I've helped lots of organisations and teams respond to lots of different types of incidents, for example, terrorist attacks in London and Manchester and Belgium and France and Germany, floods and earthquakes, um, global cyber attack and most recently bushfires in Australia. So I'm joining you from Australia today. Um, the IIRSM have very kindly asked me to talk to you about business continuity and the foundations of business continuity. And I'd really like to thank you for joining us today. And I hope you take something valuable from this presentation. Just very quickly before we start, um, I didn't show you my picture, but that's me and that's who I am. Today, we're going to be talking about a couple of things. We're gonna put some definition around business continuity and give you some clear, um, clear guidance as to what it is and what it isn't, if you like. We're then going to discuss some of the um, processes that sit under the business continuity management framework. So we're going to talk about business impact analysis. We're gonna talk about plans and teams and exercises. And we're gonna talk about the current climate very briefly at the end and um, some ideas around what I think um, we, are, we should do or we should be doing right now. So business continuity, what is business continuity? So there's a definition on your screen, um, and that's from ISO 22301. I'm not going to read that to you. I'm going to let you read that. Um, what I want to draw out is business continuity is when we look at what our organisation does, and it invites us to imagine what the worst things that could be that could happen. So I bet none of us were imagining that um, we would be suffering from a global pandemic at the moment. But it gives us this, the safe space to look at what the worst is that can happen and how we can plan to recover from that or how, how we can put in place mitigation measures to be sure that our organi organisation will survive. And there are several phases to the business continuity process. And I'll talk you through some of these at a moment, but I, in a moment, but I thought it might be useful to compare and contrast and give you the definition of crisis and crisis management. So again, you've got the definition on your screen, I'm not gonna read it to you, but crisis management um, deals with the strategic and reputational impacts to an organization. It's that very high level piece and you will have a crisis management team and a crisis management plan in place most probably. Business continuity is also not um, what is called disaster recovery. So disaster recovery is the IT part of business continuity, if you like. There's lots of jargon in this industry. So I'll try and demystify some of that as we go along. Um, business continuity is also not emergency management. So emergency management is the immediate response to an incident that might involve um, having teams in place that respond to think people like uh, first aid officers and emergency wardens, that kind of thing. And that might form part of your business continuity plan but that is also sometimes treated as a completely separate um, industry, if you like. Um, but all of these all of these terms are interconnected and do talk to one another. And it's really important to understand that they don't operate in silos. They all need to come together. So an outline of the process that we're going to talk today. So from a business continuity perspective, what do we do? So we're going to firstly investigate. So we're going to look at what our key activities, um, processes, goods and services are 
and we're going to look at um, what we might need to do to protect them and we'll talk about that in a moment. We're going to talk about all three of these things. Then we're going to look at design and part of design, not the only thing to do with design, is uh, business continuity plans. So we'll talk about plans and teams and we'll also talk about testing. So business continuity exercises, which is my favourite part of the job, um, but it's also a really important part of the process. And I should point out, I probably should have mentioned earlier, this is not a, a webinar designed to teach or to give advice to seasoned business continuity professionals. This is for people who want to understand a bit more about business continuity and how it works and how it might fit into your organisation and how you might be able to help. So let's look at business impact analysis. So again, a definition of business impact analysis Assuming that you have got some kind of senior management buy-in to the business continuity management process, um, one of the first things you'll need to do is understand what key activities are essential to keep your organisation running. And depending on your industry, that might be parts of your manufacturing process or delivering goods or services to your clients. And once you've got that list of key activities, you'll need to go and talk to the people who run those processes. These are the people who will know all about it, inside out and upside down. And you'll need to ask them questions. And some of those questions will look like this. So how many people will need to carry, will you need to carry out this activity if something happened? Um, where can you carry out this activity? Can you do it from an alternative site? Now putting COVID to one side for now. Imagine another incident has happened. Could you work from, if you work in an office, could you work from another office? Could you work from a disaster recovery site? Could you work from an alternative site? Sometimes that will be possible, sometimes that won't be possible. What equipment do you need? So different industries will have different, different types of needs. So if you work in catering, you might not be able to have all of your um, cooking equipment um, at another site, but you might be able to take your coffee machine with you, for example. Um, what IT resources do you need? What particular IT um, hardware and software do you need? Think about all of those kinds of things. Are there any sensitivities or legal or regulatory requirements that you need to be considering if you perhaps aren't working from your regular site or your your process is being disrupted. Do you need to report any of that to a regulator? Has there been a data breach, that kind of thing? Is there any seasonality to the work that you do? And again, this will depend on the nature of your organisation. So you might have payroll at a particular time of the, the week or month. You might week or month. You might have billing cycles. Um, if you work in education, you might need to factor in enrolments or examinations. Those kinds of factors will um, determine your, your hot points, if you like, where your pressure points in your processes are. Supply chains, um, time limits. I'm going to talk about time limits first. I've taken the jargon out of this presentation because I find it um, doesn't help people. So I've called it time limits here, but there is um, a specific set of terminology that works around the business impact analysis process and it asks questions like how long can you um, survive working um, if you are impacted at a certain level what kind of data do you need to recover to um, that's really important because you might be able to limp along for a day or a week or a month but three months would kill the organization it's really important to assess those time limits the supply chain piece is very relevant at the moment, I think, and you need to consider where you sit in a supply chain, both internally in your organisation and externally. So people will be depending on you to provide an activity or a product or a service, and you'll be relying on other people, and it's important to capture all of that information in the business impact analysis process. And it's also really important to capture the key risks um, at this point. So at the moment, everyone's working from home and we, some of us quite like it. Um, some of us are quite used to it. But organisations might not have thought about some of the information security um, problems that might come with that. Have we breached any client terms? 
Um, is the data secure? Have we breached any regulation by taking client data home or have we, have we missed any considerations? So we should be capturing all of those kinds of things on a register or noting them somewhere. So once you've got a picture of what's required by each of your key activities, you can then start reviewing them and holistically designing your response. And one of those responses is a business continuity plan. So the way you create plans will depend on the size and the nature and the scale and the maturity of your organisation. Everyone's going to be a little bit different. There is no standard here. Um, it's what works for your organisation. You can look to um, the Business Continuity Institute, you can look to the ISO, and they will give you guidelines um, and sort of frameworks, if you like, to hang your plans on. But it will depend on your organisation as well. It's likely that you'll have a crisis response plan in place, and that will deal with the strategic and reputational issues. And you might have specific IT and emergency management plans and response teams for that too. But again, today, we are just talking about business continuity plans and all of these plans need to fit together. I can't stress that enough. They can't work in isolation. In terms of the business continuity plans, you might want to create one for each business impact analysis you've undertaken on a specific activity or process, or you might choose to combine them. Again, it depends on your organisation. And depending on whether you want your plans to be tactical or operational, um, you would expect to see things like the, the issues listed on the screen. So who are your key staff? Who are your team? Where will you work if you are going to an alternative location? Where will the team meet? Um, what about your welfare services? You know, do you have counselling services on tap? Do you have um, special security services, your security people, do you need to call in additional security? Um, your technology, your communications and your data considerations, your transports and your logistics, do you want to bus people to an alternative site? Do you have a local taxi firm on retainer that could help move people in the event of an emergency? Um, who are your key suppliers? Do you have alternatives if, some, if something happens and you need something quickly? Um, your resource requirements and contact details for those resources as needed. Um, you'll also need to include details on things like how will the plan be invoked? So how will the team come together? Who will invoke the team? Where will the team meet? What are the roles and responsibilities of each member of that team? Um, your training and exercise requirements and how the team will stand down and when I create uh, business continuity plans in my current and previous life as, as an in-house person, I found the use of checklists really useful because in a, in a crisis or an emergency or a, uh, a, an incident, your body chemistry um, alters and your brain might not function as, as well as it could. And so having checklists in place will help you remember what you might need to do. It, it, they act as a prompt. Um, I'm a big fan of a checklist. So both your business impact analysis and your plans should be reviewed and updated at least annually or after management changes or after significant events or exercises. So every time, um, and we'll, we'll talk about exercises in a moment, but every time I've run an exercise, we've discovered something new. Um, and the plans have been updated, particularly in the current environment where people working very differently. Um, it's, it's the time to be reviewing your plans and updating, but we'll talk more about that later. So, teams. So, teams are really important and you will, um, those who've heard me speak before will understand how passionate I am about people and making sure that um, people are okay and that you've got the right people on your team. So again, irrespective of the size and nature of your organisation, you'll probably have some kind of plan in place and people named on that plan. But often those people either don't know that they're on the plan or they know they're on the plan, but they don't really know what to do. So for that plan to be effective, it needs to come to life and the people on the plan need to understand their roles and responsibilities. 
And you need to be sure that you've got the right people on the team so that they can work together effectively and efficiently during an incident. It's a high pressure situation quite often. And one way you can do this is through tabletop exercises. And we'll talk about the value of those exercises in a moment. But exercises offer the opportunity to identify any biases in the behavior of those involved in managing an incident so that they can be reviewed appropriately. And the more emotionally charged a learning experience is, the better it's remembered. So for example, if a business continuity team leader or a crisis manager will only delegate tasks to a sim single member of a team, this can be objectively identified as part of an exercise and mitigation strategies can be put into place. An individual might do this because they know and trust a particular team member or they're alike in some way, which is, you know, people like people who are like them. We know that we know that that's a common bias. Um, however, this can cause a bottleneck in a crisis and this behavior does need to be avoided. So understanding this in a simulation or an exercise means that changes can be made. And if necessary, the exercise can be run again to test the alternatives to ensure that they work. Alternatively, and I have seen this happen, someone might on the team might feel uncomfortable with their role and choose to step away from the responsibility. And it's much better to know and understand this during an exercise than subject that individual to learning about themselves during an incident. It's really important. And for a team to work effectively during an incident, it's important to give them the opportunity to work together during an exercise so that they can build rapport they can feel that element of psychological safety that's really important. Um, they can understand their strengths and weaknesses and build on their capability. Not everyone in the team should have the same strengths or weaknesses. They come together as a team. That's what a team is all about. And that's essential to building resilience within an organisation. Some other considerations include understanding roles and responsibilities. So making sure everyone involved knows exactly what they need to do. Um, and we've talked about checklists already. And I'd, I'd recommend um, a book called The Checklist Manifesto by somebody called Atul Gawande. Um, it's a great book. It will give you some background into why I'm so passionate about using checklists in plans. Um, they're really helpful. Um, consider communication. So is, anything, is there anything that you can do to help facilitate better communication within the team? So some organisations are really hot on their internal acronyms or their internal language. Um, make sure that's included in, in your planning and your exercising. Um, think about the preference and the culture of an organisation as well. Different organisations use different channels. So some are very happy to use WhatsApp or their emergency messaging system. Um, some people like text, some people like to call, some people even prefer email in an incident. And I have worked with people and that has worked for them. So whatever works for a particular team and a particular organisation, consider all of those channels as well. Team building. Now, this is controversial. Um, some teams are great at socialising with one another. Others, um, the culture of the organisation just, just doesn't support that and people are just not interested. But if possible, you know, meet together socially. That can really help to build that sense of a team and that will help that response when something happens. So desktop exercises. As I said, these are my favourite part of my job. Um, we've talked a little bit about them already, but what are the benefits of exercising? And when I first started out in this role, um, they're quite an investment for an organisation and often you have to sell an exercise to senior management. So these are some of the ways you can sell exercises internally. So it will help you to validate the technical, logistical and administrative aspects of the business continuity plan. So, for example, have, is what you've written in the plan practical? I've seen plans that set out really detailed processes on how you will respond and in reality, it just doesn't happen. So is what you've got there practical? If you agree that the team will convene in a particular meeting room on a particular floor in a particular building, is that possible? Is, it, is that room the right room? Has it got all the facilities you need? Um, if you say you're going to meet in a cafe down the road, um, is it practical? Will they fit you in? Um, will you be able to hear one another speak? Do you need some privacy? Um, 
out of hours, does your conference calling facility work? Um, if you need to all call one another, how are you going to do that? Um, your emergency messaging system might help, but who is going to use it and how is it going to be used? You're, you're validating and testing all of these pieces of the plan. It will be, you know, you'll set some objectives and this will be part of your testing of that. You'll validate those measures. It also can validate the suitability of your command infrastructure. So your command centres, your work areas, your technology, your telecoms, as we've just touched on. If you've got a recovery site, have you tested it? What would happen if all of your telecom systems are linked to your PCs and the system's hacked? Have you got a list of everyone's mobile numbers? How would you contact people? What would you do? Um, and at the moment, you know, I, I'm suspecting those of us who are working from home at the moment do know how to log on remotely, but in a separate incident, would you know how to log on at a recovery site if that is one of your options? It also enables teams to further develop business continuity plans following their exercise. And I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, every exercise I've ever run, you learn lessons, you improve as you go along. And it's really important to debrief and put these lessons into the um, debrief post-exercise report. And any subsequent actions need to be captured and implemented. It's really important. Um, it often also improves plans across the board. So if you share this information with other people as well, all of the plans will be updated and improved. So for example, one team I ran an exercise with um, realised that they needed to put their hands on the insurance documents for their office really quickly and nobody knew where they were kept. So they managed to include that in their plan. Um, another team thought it was really important that they listed um, really good locksmiths in a particular area because if people had to leave the building without their keys and their coats, how would they get into their homes? So they listed a locksmith on their plans. These little things came out of running exercises. Um, it also helps to agree and make specific decisions ahead of time. So again, um, COVID has sort of tipped this on its head and a lot of people are working from home at the moment, but it's not a popular choice for many organisations. But determining these hard decisions up front, and I think this will, will come out again when we um, are looking at returning to our places of work for those of us who need to do that, um, making those decisions up front and clearly communicating them will be really important. Um, it also, min exercises also minimise disruption during an incident. The more a team practices, um, the better they are at responding. It's also important to make sure um, from your resource management perspective now that all of the business continuity team members are aware of their roles and responsibilities. So if people don't know what's expected of them, they can actually be a hindrance during an incident if you need to stop and explain. I can't tell you how important that is. You don't want to be trying to bring somebody or train somebody um, while an incident is actually happening. It's also important that if you have alternates listed on your plan that they are equally trained and they know what to do as well. Um, one of the things that people find a little bit challenging but is again really important, I know I keep talking about importance here, um, I, know I keep talking about importance here um, and if not all members of a business continuity team are, are required for a particular incident, ask people to stand down, it's business, it's not personal. Um, the fewer people, the better quite often um, in a response. Um, are the right people on the team? Uh, sometimes you might need to swap out team members and I sort of touched on this briefly earlier. I, um, I trained a team once and somebody burst into tears because they found the exercise very stressful. It triggered them, it triggered their anxiety. Um, and it's really important to handle that sensitively and know that ahead of time. Other people might be less inclined to be involved because they don't consider it as part of their job and they're not being paid for it, so they might be reluctant to be part of the team. For whatever reason, a person does not want to be on a team or is not willing to be on a team, listen to that and swap that person out. You need that team to run as a well-oiled machine. Um, and another resource management consideration, finally, is, is does everyone have the right equipment? If you're on the team, do you need a laptop? Do you need a mobile phone? Have you got that? Have you got access to that equipment? It's really important. Um, learning. 
learning enables your business continuity team to test their plan in a safe environment. Everybody should have an opportunity to contribute in that exercise. It helps the learning stick. It doesn't matter if the response is less than right, if you like, um, because the more emotionally charged that learning experience is, the better it will be remembered. It helps to provide muscle memory. So I, when I'm giving training on this, I liken it to um, if you're on a sports team, you're training for your match day. If you're an artistic person, you are rehearsing your lines for a play um, or you're rehearsing for a show. Um, the more often you practice, the better that muscle memory is and those learnings will, will help you respond during an incident. You'll perform it effectively on the day, basically. It also provides confidence in the effectiveness of the plans and the personnel capability. So the team will be more invested in the plans and each other if they're actively contributing. And that also helps to reduce the bias that sometimes comes out of these exercises. Um, assurance, again, um, this is something we're seeing more of. It demonstrates to clients and regulators and other interested parties that the organisation is resilient and it's got a greater level of maturity in the business continuity framework. We're seeing more and more client audits um, and insurers asking for evidence, not only of plans, which was historically all they would ask for, but um, details of the exercises, of the lessons learned, what were the recommendations, how were they implemented. Um, this is becoming a really key area um, for not only for um, authorities, if you like, but clients are really seeking um, to see that the people they do business with have thought about these things. Um, now in the future, so we're coming to the end of our, of our webinar today. I just want to talk um, briefly about some of these considerations. So at the moment, you should be considering a specialist team to horizon scan what the future might look like. And that might include um, being hit by another incident in the middle of the, the COVID-19 crisis. So how would your organisation respond if something else happened on top of this? Um, my bias has come to the fore because I am sitting in Australia and although it's now the end of bushfire season, what would happen if another natural disaster happened or if we had floods um, on top of this? It's, you know, the organisations I've seen here have been struggling to survive following on from the bushfires and having COVID-19 laid on top. If you had a cyber incident on top of what you're managing now, how would you survive? How have your plans adapted to ensure that you would be resilient and you would continue to operate? We also need to be considering some of the recovery options at the moment. And you might want to be thinking about things like what would the first day back at work look like for our people? So if you work in an office block um, and it's a multi-storey building and you're considering how many people you might be able to put in with physical distancing, how many people could you get in a lift or the elevator at one time? How would you manage that? Can you get enough people onto your floor at any one time? Um, how will you check for illness what if somebody comes down sick at work what what will your new process be? what if somebody comes down sick at work emergency plans look like um, if everybody has to evacuate a building really quickly um, what about your policies do your policies need to be updated what about your working from home policy or your sickness reporting policy what if somebody's off sick for one day exhibiting symptoms will you require them to go and have a test is that even possible um, and if they do get diagnosed, what are you going to do with the rest of the people who might have been in the office or on site that day? Will you request that those people go into isolation for a period of time or will they get tested too? All of these considerations, there's lots and lots of things to think about. Um, you know, these are just touching the surface. But now is the time to start thinking about those considerations and making those decisions and start communicating with people and that should be a two-way dialogue between the organisation senior management and also the workforce and the team in the middle should be making recommendations and trying to help smooth that process. 
Um, your supply chain review is really important as well at the moment. You should be looking at whether you can continue to function as part of a supply chain. So are your suppliers able to give you what you need? Um, if you think in terms of, you know, specialist software companies, quite often they're small, small organisations. Are you able to work with them? Are they able to provide you with any assurances? If you require a particular piece of kit from another part, of the world. What are their situations like at the moment? Have their restrictions been lifted um, or are they even further behind us? And reviewing and updating your business impact analysis and your plans, this is absolutely the right time to be doing it um, if you are able to do that at the moment. Um, look at how things have changed. Look at how we need to adapt, how agile we have to be in our processes and to continue to operate. So this is now the time to start looking at those considerations. So that is the very quick canter through business continuity um, foundations and some thoughts for the future. I hope you've found that helpful and useful. And I'll now hand back to Holly. Um, and we'll Thanks, Carla. So um, as mentioned at the start, it's now time to go through to some questions um, for Carla. So if you have anything you'd like to ask, please type the chat function now and we'll take five to ten minutes to answer them. So whilst we have some through already, we'll just wait for a few more to come through as well. So in the meantime, um, I've got a couple of questions for you, Carla. So Thank first you. of all, um, how important is it for organisations to have business continuity plans relating to specific events such as pandemics as opposed to generic plans? So I, I'm a big fan of a specialist plan. Um, it depends on what level we're speaking. So at a crisis management level, um, you'll probably see more specialist plans. At a business continuity level, maybe you'll see less specialist plans. It just depends on the incident that we're talking about. So if we're talking about something like a cyber incident, there will be specific, and if you have cyber insurance, there will be specific um, actions that you need to take the minute you become aware of a cyber incident. So you might have to notify your insurers within a specific period of time, um, and they will parachute in a team potentially. If there is a regulatory raid or an incident to do with a regulator, there will be legal implications. So you'll need to follow certain processes. Um, a bushfire plan is, is, again, parochially one of my favourites at the moment. And that plan, you'll be monitoring things like temperature and wind direction and weather forecasts. And the details in that plan will set out the triggers for your decision response. And that's really important. The beauty of having specialist plans is you can set them as annexes to your big core plan, if you like. Business continuity plans don't have to be huge and unwieldy. You can have as many of them as you like. You might want to have a core plan and then multiple um, specialist plans. It just, as I said earlier, it depends on the size and nature and complexity of your organisation, what environment you're in. You know, if you're in an earthquake zone, you might want an earthquake plan. I've, I've drafted those before. Um, it just helps you strip out the things that you might need to do in a specific incident, and that's always helpful. Okay, great. And uh, the next question is, in a recent report from the UK's Business Continuity Institute, 41% um, of respondents mentioned their organisation's business continuity planning had assumed that we would return to normal post-pandemic, um, yet now only a quarter of organisations that were surveyed plan to revert to their old business model. Um, so what challenges does this pose for business continuity? I think this is a really exciting time for business continuity and for business continuity practitioners as well. Not reverting to a previous business model is almost inevitable. I think the world is changing very quickly and I think for businesses to survive, uh, you know, we're all using the word agile at the moment, but people need to, businesses and organisations need to be flexible in their in their response to um, what they're going to do in the future because their clients want different things. Um, everybody is, is moving very quickly. So from a business continuity practitioner's perspective, 
we have to move with that and we have to be looking at our business impact analysis and our key processes and what's changed and what might change. We have to become adept at horizon scanning and looking at and anticipating what risks might be coming over the horizon. And there's a lot of material being published at the moment. There are many, many surveys and many, many papers and theories being proposed at the moment. And there's a lot of noise, but there is a lot of good content out there. And I think as organisations reassess their risks and their principal risks in particular, the business continuity plans and crisis management plans and all, all of the plans need to be adapted. So, you know, going out and talking to people across the business, finding out what's changed, you know, especially working patterns, for example, um, how we are working, hours we're working, mental health issues, health issues, full stop. We need to incorporate that into our business continuity plan. So it's going to be a very busy time for us, but also probably one of the most interesting times we have if, if we love this job. Right, we've had a few questions come through So now. do we have any other questions, Holly? Yes, we've got three more that have come through. So sure. the first is how can we plan and exercise a business continuity plan if the crisis is unprecedented? That's a good question. Um, that comes back to the horizon scanning point. So looking at um, your organisation's risk register and particularly the principal risk register, what is going to threaten the, um, the strategy or the, the existence of your organisation? but also looking further afield and um, looking at, at reports like the World Economic Forum report that comes out every year, you know, what are the top global risks this year? What do we see coming over the horizon? And in the world of risk management and business continuity, we've been talking about pandemic for years. I don't think any of us, well, I'm sure some did, but many of us didn't think it would be this far reaching um, but lots of people did have pandemic plans and they had rehearsed them in the last year. So it's about thinking about well, what could happen uh, and how might we respond to that, building that into a plan, then drafting an exercise to test that and then seeing what falls out of the side and saying, okay, well, we actually need to build up our resilience in this area. We didn't think about that. We haven't thought that this could could be quite so extreme. And I appreciate that it can be quite challenging to get buy-in from senior management to engage in these things. I do think, however, in the current climate, people are more open to thinking about what else might go wrong. So it's, it's about being engaged, being inquisitive, being curious and looking, looking to see what could possibly go wrong. It's, it's part of the fun of this job. It's um, it's creating those scenarios and testing them. I hope that answers your question. Okay, and the next question is, is there a structure or a hierarchy that interconnect or interrelate between different emergency response, crisis management, and business continuity teams within an organisation? There quite often is. And again, it comes back to uh, the size, the nature and complexity of your organisation. So in, in my experience, I have um, created a, usually a three-tier structure, so gold, gold teams are the crisis management team, and there's usually one of those, and it usually consists of senior management. There are pros and cons to having very senior management on that team, and if you can keep the CEO off that team um, and use them as a spokesperson instead, uh, then you might have silver or tactical teams, so they will be the conduit between um, the bronze teams, who are usually the people responding on the ground. So it's a, a UK emergency response um, hierarchy, if you like. So gold, silver and bronze. Bronze, operational, responding to the event on the ground. Silver tactical being the conduit between the bronze team and the gold team. And the gold team looking after the strategic management. Emergency management teams can be folded into the bronze teams or can live on their own. It just depends on your organisation. I've seen this cut many, many different ways, but there's, there is usually a hierarchy. Um, the gold team or the crisis management team usually deals with the media and the reputational issues. So they will be issuing most of the communications, if that helps. I hope that answers your question. 
Thanks, Carla. And um, the next one is how many tiers down the supply chain would you expect a manufacturing business to look? Um, so would that be all the way down to raw material extraction? Oh, gosh, um, I can't answer that with any authority. Um, it depends on you, on your organisation. Of course, you're going to want to go down as far as you can. You're going to want to look at, at things like um, their business continuity plans. It just depends how, how comfortable you are. And there are experts out there who can answer this question for you. I would want to see as much as I could. I would want some reassurances around not just does an organisation have a business continuity plan? And I'm sure that you have been asked this question before on supplier questionnaires. People will say, do you have a business continuity plan? Now, that's a really generic question and it's not very helpful. And there's usually not just one plan. There are probably very many plans. I would want evidence of... Um, you know, do you, do you have teams in place? Do you exercise the teams? It's what we were saying in the assurance piece. It might be part of your um, supply chain management. It might be part of your procurement processes. And it might be a question that you ask your, your suppliers to say, well, how far down do you go in your supply chain assessment? Unfortunately, I can't give you a concrete answer on how far down I'd go, I'm afraid. OK, and we'll take the final two questions now before we close um, for today. So the sure. first one is when businesses are desperately trying to survive and reestablish themselves, will the need for learning and improved preparedness be squeezed by other understandable priorities? Quite possibly, but I would hope that this is one of those priorities. Um, I think the ability to think and make decisions on an organisation's future with this in mind will help organisations survive. I have been involved in some very big crises in my time, uh, not necessarily as big as this worldwide, but for an organisation, um, we called it an existential crisis. And actually, the one thing we did as an organisation when we returned to normal, if you like, as part of the recovery process, is we invested heavily in looking at our resilience and our business continuity planning and running lots and lots of scenarios and working out our playbooks and determining, well, what could take us under? Where are we vulnerable? What are our risks? And that was essential to keeping us afloat. And it's a, it's a really tough question because, yes, people are absolutely trying to survive at the moment, but... Um, there is help out there. Um, just as a side plug, um, we will be publishing very soon lots of templates and how-to guides and, and ways of helping people manage this because I think it's really important that people can survive at, at the moment. Um, so we can give you some more information on that later. But, um, yeah, tough question, really tough question. OK, and the final question is, how should business continuity planning be considered when looking at proposed business changes? Um, has the move to agile working greatly increased the impact of the pandemic? I'm not sure I understand the second half of the question, but the first half of the question, can you just repeat that for me, Holly? Yeah, sure. So it's how should business continuity planning be considered when looking at proposed business changes? Yes, so any change to an organisation, um, business continuity, business impact analysis and business continuity plans should be updated as a result of any changes to a business. It put COVID to one side. If you have new senior management come in, you might want to review, you should review your plans and review your teams in case they need to be on the teams. If you bring in a new product or a new service and that is critical to your business, you should be re-looking at your business impact analysis and your plans and updating them accordingly. So in the current world, we're gonna to have to be doing that a lot more frequently. Um, and if you look at some of the surveys that are out, the Business Continuity Institute in particular has just released a survey and they're talking about how often people are reviewing their plans and it, it's very frequent. Um, so what we might've gotten away with doing every six months or every year we're now going to have to do more frequently so um that will that will keep us busy i think the working from home angle 
um, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to have to look at our policies and we're going to have to look at what are the risks to people working from home and folding that into our plans and our responses because we need to make sure our emergency planning responds to people working from home where people might be working in an office or on a particular site. You know, the, the alarm goes and everybody goes out. What happens if something happens at home? So our, our emergency management responses are going to have to change as as a result of people working from home and um, different working patterns all of those kinds of things will have to have to be taken into consideration many organizations are creating um, if, they're, if they're big enough they'll create a working group to look at all of these things and start folding them in if you are not big enough to be doing that it might be worthwhile sitting down with a piece of paper and just thinking, well, okay, what are the things that could wipe me out or where are my biggest risks? Um, and this is where business continuity talks to risk management. They shouldn't be separate issues um, or separate disciplines. They should fold into one another. And that's where you can, that's the best bang for your buck, if you like. That's where you're going to find um, that you can make yourself more resilient by trying to plug those gaps and mitigate those risks before something happens. So I hope that answers that question as well. Thanks, Carla. So that's all the time we have for um, questions today. I will send a link to the recording before the end of the week so you're able to recap in your own time. And Carla, you have some other resources that you're able to share um, with the participants. Absolutely. As well, don't you? So I have drafted a recovery checklist and some recovery scenarios and a recovery risk register that we will share with you for free. Um, we want people to um, have as many resources as they can to help them um, stay on their feet at the moment. So unfortunately, I don't have them in time for the recording, but they will be coming, I promise. Yep, yeah, I'll send those um, across to everyone in a couple of weeks' time. So um, before we go today, uh, Carla, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. Um, I think yeah, thanks for having me, Holly. Very useful. And thank you to everyone for joining as well. So um, enjoy the rest of your days and goodbye. Thanks.